think it's a very hot topic and very up to date, and uh, I won't waste much of your time. I will present our distinguished speakers, and uh, we will uh, continue then with the Q and A session. Uh, so uh, st we're starting with uh, uh, Mr. Marco Cartolice, which is an associate professor of law in Unstinianus Primus uh, Scopia. Uh, he's with us virtually, so welcome, Mr. Cartolice. Um, and then we move on with uh, Mr. Ilya Gusbodinov, who is Managing Director of Endava Skopje and uh, Group Compliance Manager of Endava. Um, then we'll move on with uh, a presentation by uh, John Harhas, who is Founder and President of Infinity Greece. And last but not least, uh, Mrs. Bora Muzaki, Minister, uh, Minister of State for uh, Youth and Children in Albania. So thank you very much for being here today. Um, so I would like to start with Mr. Kertolice and um, uh, ask you um, how prepared have we been in terms of uh, pandemic crisis and in terms of digitalization? How, re how ready has the region been to, to adapt to all these changes and uh, what were the uh, intersectional challenges that we had to face uh, during these two years? Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Do you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can. I guess it is okay. Uh, at the very beginning, let me say good afternoon. Uh, let me uh, say that it's my honor to be part of the International Youth Conference 2021. Uh, as the moderator already mentioned, my name is Marco Kartolica. I work as an assistant professor at the Faculty of Law Justinianus Primus. More precisely, I'm working at the Department of Constitutional Law and Political System. If you go more deeply regarding my background, uh, you will notice that I obtained in 2008, I obtained my BA degree in the field of political science. After that, I completed my MA studies at University of Graz, Austria and University of Barcelona in Spain. And finally, in 2019, I completed my PhD program under the supervision of Gordana Siljanov Skadavko. Today, in front of you, I'm going to speak more uh, precisely about the COVID-19 and the impact of COVID-19 over the democracy and democratic values, uh, connections between the digitalization and democracy. But at the very beginning, I would like just to give brief introduction. Usually when I start to teach, I start to teach by using the quote of Aristoteles, Zon Politikon. I use this quote because behind this Zon Politikon is the idea that the humans are political creatures, po political beings, or to be more precise, men are political animals. The idea that the men are political animal means that humans must live in a society with other humans. Aristoteles mentions, mentioned that only God and beast, beasts can live without others. We are definitely not gods. We tend not to be beasts. So the only option is to live with others in a society. That's the good part. That's the tricky part. Because to live with others means to live with other interests, with too many interests of different individuals. And in that um, occasion, it is very important to stress out that you need to organize yourself with others, with other individuals. Uh, that is the eternal questions. How uh, eternal question of the political uh, theory, how to organize yourself or how to organize yourself in a perfect society. Starting from Plato, Aristoteles, Campanella, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Diverget today, all authors are searching for the perfect way to organize our uh, society. In the 21st century, we very often uh, stress out the popular say of Winston Churchill that the democracy is the worst form of government, except for the, all the others that have been tried. And yes, it is true that it's not the perfect political regime. However, it is true that it's better definitely than communism, than fascism, than absolute monarchs, than uh, military juntas, the theocracies, and so on and so on. So yes, it is the best what we have. 
Uh, it is best because in democracy we speak about human rights, because we speak about the rule of law, because we speak about uh, limited government, separation of uh, powers, and so on and so on. Elections, multi-party system, and so on and so on. However, also it's true that in the last two decades, democracy has declined. It is not very strange today to say that in the last two decades, the number of authoritarian leaders, the number of dictatorships, the number of authoritarian competitiveness has been on the rise. Uh, additionally, we analyze the radical right movement has constantly from one elections to another managing to get more votes. So the thing here that I would like to stress that the situation with the democracy even before the COVID-19 was not good. The COVID-19 outbreak additionally has put it pressure on democracy has put that pressure on democracy because the COVID-19 is uh, hurting the main, main pillars of democratic society. For example, when we speak about democratic society, we speak about protection and guarantees of human rights and freedoms. It is true that during the COVID-19 crisis, great number of our human rights have been restricted in order to face the challenges of the COVID-19. Freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, right to liberty, right to respect of private life, and so on and so on. So right now, we are starting to learn that even in democracy, we can live with great number of liberties and freedoms restricted by the authorities for us. The second point that we should take into the consideration, the limitation of government. Again, when we speak about democracy, we speak about limited government, we speak about separation of powers. However, under the button of the state of emergency situations, very often the parliaments were marginalized. Instead creating policies inside the parliament, policies usually were created by governments by creating governmental decrees. Right now, we can notice that several scientific papers are pointing out that governments in the period of COVID, uh, executive governments in the period of uh, COVID-19 were becoming more influential and less controlled than they would be in ordinary times. So practically here, we are not uh, speaking perfectly in the terms that the parliament is controlling the government and that the parliament is creating the laws and the government, executive government is here to implement them. But we are speaking that small number of persons behind closed doors are making fast decisions because the COVID-19 crisis is asking them to make fast decisions. Come to the third pillar, elections. The idea behind the elections is that the elections are mechanism given to us to choose our rulers. If you do not possess the elections as a mechanism, you cannot choose your rulers. You cannot make the decision who is going to govern instead of you. It is fact that during the 2020, most of the elections were canceled or postponed. So the thing is that if you do not have elections, if the elections are canceled, then you do not have the power to influence the rulers. The second thing, even when the elections were held, pretty, uh, pretty often we have ended in a situation where the turnout on the elections was pretty low. And when the turnout is pretty low, then we are starting to face another challenge, the legitimacy of the political institutions. I will end this part by stressing that, again, the media during the COVID-19 crisis was additionally influenced 
by the government because usually during the news, during the media program, the governmental officials took the time to speak about COVID-19, about the measures, and the political opposition was not so present during such uh, debates and news. So the thing is that COVID-19 definitely uh, has contributed additionally to the decline of the democracy, not just speaking about the region, but speaking about the democracy in the world. When we come to the region, we can conclude that the COVID-19 has opened the space additionally for arbitrary measures, for influence of the media, for uh, organizing elections when the time is right for the government, marginalizing of the parliaments and so on and so on. So the situation is not good. However, I tend to say that we have survived. We have survived, the democracy ha uh, has survived because the new technology has managed to keep democracy running. Virtual session of parliaments were organized. Virtual forums were organized. Virtual debates were organized. Virtual campaigning was organized. So the thing is that the new technology managed somehow to keep democracy working and we managed to survive. But I would like to stress out that surviving is simply not enough when we speak about democratic societies. In democratic societies, we need to flourish. In order to flourish, definitely we need to get back the conventional politics. We need to get back the real parliament. We need to get back the real uh, campaigning, door-to-door -door activities, real debates, and so on and so on. However, in the post-pandemic era, even the conventional politics will not be enough. We are going to need to combine the conventional politics with the democracy organized through the new technologies. We will need to uh, combine them in order democracy to flourish. And we are going to need to create a new world. And it's up to us, it's up to you to create such world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Kretolica. Actually, these were some very enlightening uh, remarks. Uh, and so I keep your words that uh, new technology made um, democracy work. Uh, but uh, new technology has also affected other aspects of life, uh, except, uh, except, except for uh, democracy per se. Uh, and uh, we're talking about now a uh, new work environments, about um, uh, a shift to a digital era that is more or less, uh, let's say, um, enforced due to the pandemic. So I would like to give the floor to Mr. Uh, Gospodinov uh, from Endava Skopje uh, and uh, ask you how this transition has affected the productivity of young people and uh, what are the recent trends uh, in this transition. So the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much. Can you hear me well? First, I'd like to say that it's a privilege to be here today. Um, thank you for inviting me. I remember quite a few instances when I was uh, on your side uh, on similar conferences 20, 25, 30 years ago. And uh, this is, um, I believe, a very um, eager group, a very positive group. Uh, at least through a few conversations that we've had today, uh, we can see and we understand that uh, there's energy here that uh, you would like to express um, in uh, proper ways and actually present the future with uh, the changes that you necessarily need to happen. So, I am currently having multiple roles. Uh, I've had a very interesting career through multiple very different roles. Um, please? Ah, 
closer to the microphone? Okay. So, um, but I'm not going to go uh, into that. Um, I'm going to go into uh, myself having uh, three roles currently at the moment. So while, um, while I am the managing director of Endava Skopje, which is one of the biggest IT service companies in Macedonia currently, um, I also have uh, the privilege of two additional roles being the group quality manager and the group compliance manager for um, Endava as a group meaning the whole, um, the whole group of companies and Dava with 10,000 plus employees. So this is my uh, perspective, my view that uh, I'll try to share with you today. Starting with uh, what um, our respected professor just said, um, yes, I, I uh, fully support those notions. And uh, when, we, when we discuss the future, it's we, we cannot uh, stay away, we cannot move away from what we are currently facing. And what we are currently facing is uh, some type of a, of a hybrid model of, of, of living, of doing business, of doing politics, um, of surviving, as the professor said. And um, when, when, when we discuss, uh, this is a very good starting notion because when we discuss youth, our youth is our future, wherever we are. So, um, uh, whether, whether it's here, or, or it's uh, Latin America, or, or it's Asia, or it's Africa, or it's, uh, or it's, uh, or it's America, or it's North America, um, it's, it's interesting how, how young people gather together, specifically uh, right now, as technology uh, has provided uh, easy ways to do it. And it's very interesting to see um, young people, for example, our employees in my company, uh, that are young engineers for the most part, coming together on very similar ideas and uh, with uh, very uh, similar um, energy for change and with uh, a very similar mindset to actually do something in the direction of uh, them getting to, to where they would like to get. And this is always uh, a good education, a good future, uh, a, a, a setup, which is a combined setup bet between the society, the career, and, and uh, what we have at home, where they can be fulfilled. So it's not, the, the, the notion has uh, moved away a little bit, uh, uh, at least in my impression, moved away a little bit from um, how can we be happy into how can we be fulfilled. And um, that's, that's an interesting point of discussion, let's say. Uh, we, can, we can maybe uh, get on top of that in the, in the Q&A la later. Um, so two things I, I, I'd like to, I'd like to um, uh, take away uh, from, from this initial, uh, um, uh, initial um, starting discussion on my side. When we discuss future, we, d we, we should um, discuss from, uh, from my perspective two things. It's technology and it's people. So, uh, in the first direction, when we discuss technology, I believe that we are all very much aware that currently we would uh, be nowhere. Well, civilization, the human civilization, would um, stand still without technology. Um, and even if movement would have still been possible, it would have been much slower and all, um, all, all necessities like uh, education, like travel, like business, like creating your futures would be much more difficult if it, um, if it weren't for the technology that we're using today. So um, the, first, uh, the first notion in this direction would be on my side, technology is not out there to get you. Technology is not out, out there to get us. We've seen a lot of um, 
uh, media attention uh, going in the direction of AI and the way uh, AI is going to uh, come together with humanity uh, in one point called the singularity and uh, at that point uh, we would all become one and at that point uh, humanity will cease to exist as it stands right now. Um, in my personal opinion and um, in, in the way I'm looking at the perspective of humanity developing further, I would say that uh, there's a very, very low probability that uh, technology will surpass humanity. Functionally, so meaning uh, operationally on a day-to-day -day basis, and intellectually. So, uh, having us put um, in a situation where we are afraid of technology, where we are afraid of going deeper into knowledge and into technology, uh, is, uh, I believe, uh, something that could be even detrimental to, to, d to the development, the further evolution of humanity. Um, technology historically has always added to our development, has almost never subtracted. So uh, this, uh, uh, by this I, 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 I mean that yes, there were uh, points in time where technology made some jobs obsolete, of course. For example, in the direction of uh, sewing or knitting or uh, the process of production of cars, for example, etc., etc. So in many directions, some jobs became obsolete. But what technology brought was much, much more than what it got subtracted. So uh, in that direction, I believe that we should, uh, we should keep our mindsets and that our youth should keep their mindset open to what technology brings and how we can all together use uh, technology to ease our lives, to ease the way we communicate, since uh, we are not uh, stuck in this future by surprise. We've had the discussion of hybrid modes of work five, ten years uh, ago, really starting together their pace. So we were very much expecting this. It just got here a bit sooner than we imagined. So stopping here on, on, on technology, we can further discuss uh, uh, later. When we discuss people, uh, what, we are, what we are seeing is that people, uh, that, that the future, specifically the professional future of young people, is not going to revolve that much around vocation, around what you professionally decide to do. Because um, it's uh, what the market and what your professional life is going to request even more than your professional, uh, professional expertise are going to be skills, specific skills, like being more adaptable to your uh, to professional changes, like being flexible, like being very well versed into the modern, uh, the modern streams of technology, etc. But I would like to uh, finish with, uh, with one uh, point that I believe is, uh, has the utmost importance for all of us, but for uh, you, the young people specifically. And that is the notion of integrity. I know and I understand that in the societies and in the environments where we live, it's very difficult, more difficult or less difficult in one or another society, of course. But it is difficult for young people to see and understand the value of integrity. 
of uh, having values and always really straining ourselves to do the right thing, to think ethically, and to, to, to always keep our integrity whenever uh, we are faced with a decision, whether it's a, a life decision or a business decision. And uh, in my experience, uh, in my personal experience, but also in the experience of, of the young people that I have around me, um, having integrity and, and really leading your lives uh, with integrity is something that long term will show, um, uh, will, will add the, the biggest value for you in, in your lives and in your professional futures. Thank you. So thank you very much, Mr. Gospodinov, about uh, the uh, very good points. Um, staying in the same uh, issue of employment, I have to say that, of course, we discuss about the future, but there is also uh, the present of employment that used to be the future two years ago. So we're talking now about um, uh, new, uh, how to say, new ways of work, about uh, remote um, professions about uh, uh, this, uh, let's say, um, how to say, le le this necessary evil, if I may, uh, of uh, transition, of uh, adaptation in a new system of work that uh, uh, we were not given so much time to adapt in. So continuing with this topic, I would like to, to welcome Mr. Harhas uh, uh, and uh, uh, give him the floor to give us some information about uh, his work and about uh, this topic uh, as well. Uh, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, you'll allow me to stand up so I can see the slides. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I really appreciate uh, being here. Um, we'll talk about uh, youth and uh, what maybe uh, will happen in the future. Uh, I'll just need some seconds to introduce myself. I will change slides in a very uh, te technological way. Is it like that? Is it? Oh, great. Okay, so I'm from Infinity Greece, which is a social enterprise uh, from Thessaloniki. Uh, we're not gonna really uh, look all uh, this Infinity Greece stuff. Uh, you just need to know that we help young people develop soft and, and hard skills in digital media by educational and volunteering projects. Um, we use it in three different ways. Educate, uh, which is like educational activities and projects. Uh, impact, which is like we use media uh, to bring some uh, impact all around us, uh, uh, campaigns, um, actions in the city, and entertainment activities. This goes pretty well. Okay. So our community consists of co uh, volunteers, businesses, and participants. Let's run a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Uh huh. Great. <laughs> okay. So um, what we are about uh, to talk uh, today is Kale <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will discuss about the future of work in the digital world, youth employment pathways. I really enjoyed this title. I think it uh, has uh, very important uh, words. That's why I, before that's why I highlighted uh, future. Uh, to discuss about the future, we gotta uh, take a closer look to past and today. And digital world this year, as you already mentioned, um, it came a bit faster due to COVID-19, but it would come anyway. Uh, youth employment pathways. So maybe we should discuss a bit more about youth. Uh, mm, so uh, who is youth today? Uh, what do we define as youth? For infinite degrees, for our projects, we define youth uh, as people aged 16 till 30. Uh, so many of the European projects are usually uh, about people till 30 years old. Uh, but questions a bit closer, maybe not boomers, maybe the next one, okay. Uh, youth today is consisted of um, Gen Y and uh, Gen Z, as we define in Finn degrees, people aged 16 till 30 years old. I'm 25, I feel like I'm in the middle of these two generations, I don't know if I'm really a millennial or not. Um, here are some interesting facts for both generations, Gen Y and Gen Z. Uh, I decided not to label what is for which generation, um, but I believe that 
if we want to understand where uh, jobs are going, uh, what youth uh, need, uh, what kind of uh, things will happen in the future, we should look at what uh, these generations look like, because they will save the future. We will save the future. Uh, so they consume content in a different way, they're comfortable with digital things, they have multiple social uh, media they have less brand loyalty. What does it mean? It means that they do not just follow a brand, sometimes it happens, of course, uh, it happens many times actually, but most of them uh, have no patience. If a brand disappoints them, they go uh, to another solution, they want a fast solution, they want all the information instantly. Um, on the right, we see that Gen Y is a bit uh, more dreamful, but Gen Z is realist, um, at least official, of course. You cannot label, uh, take that label and apply to every single person. Each person is uh, unique, but this is what happens uh, with uh, generations. And uh, it's important that this generation has less job experience until 25 years old, if we compare with people from pe previous generations, people that were working from 15. So now you go to school, then you go to college, and you have a master, and then you're like, let's have my first job in tw 24 years old, 25 years old. So this is uh, sometimes a bit different. And youth want to change everything. This is what um, we usually say, that youth wants to change everything. Uh, I don't know. I mean, they d uh, you we want to change things, yes. I, I don't know if we really change things or if we wake up to a world with new technology, uh, with different things happening around us, with a different environmental situation, and we adapt and bring uh, new ways, new solutions. I mean, uh, we are changing the world, but the world is changing also on its own. Um, and of course, COVID-19 fostered the digital age. Uh, and COVID-19 brought some other uh, bad things also. You see extreme global poverty rising. Um, you can see 120 million more people have been pushed into extreme poverty. This is big. This is a huge number. I don't know if, you can, uh, if we can understand how big this number is. Sometimes you look into graphs and statistics and we're like, oh, big number. Oh, it's 2%, it's 10%, it's 20,000. It's 120 million people. Here we are 70, 100. I imagine how big this number is. And you see on the right that in 2020, uh, how many jobs were, uh, how many people lose their jobs? And youth, 8.7% um, of youth lose their job. Um, so, sorry. So what youth want? What do young people really want? Um, yeah, I'm a millennial. <laughs> do they want freelance? Do they want side hustles? Do they want freedom? Do they want uh, passive income? You, you may have TikTok, you see all these uh, people advising you online how to gain passive income, how to gain new opportunities for a job, uh, how to quit your nine to five. Do you want to quit your nine to five, really? Maybe you want something safe. Maybe you want to work in corporate. Uh, maybe we want to travel. Maybe we want hybrid model. What do we want? Well, um, employers also don't know. That's why the Google article is like that. Uh, they have no idea what we want. Uh, it's like how to handle your Gen Z employees. Um, <laughs> what do they want from your workplace? Uh, it's it's just a different era, and nobody knows what uh, we really, really want. But uh, youth of today <laughs> will affect uh, the uh, workplace of tomorrow. Uh, so let's see what uh, we see that youth need, what youngsters need, and what may happen tomorrow. Um, I cannot, uh, I mean, you cannot forecast future, but you can just see some signs and some things that may really happen. So. Um, Gen, Z, uh, Gen Z needs guidance. When they're in the office, they want somebody who cares. They want somebody to guide them. They feel respected. They feel that they're not just a random employee lying around the company. Uh, they need skill development. 
Um, that's why uh, they always want to uh, do something new. They want to level up. Uh, you see, uh, it's what we were saying before, that after college, they don't know how to connect all this academic background, uh, student, be being student, then being in college, then being uh, having a master. How will this academic background apply in job uh, market? They need mental health. Um, we were discussing before that uh, Gen Z was, uh, is a generation that saw the parents struggling uh, with economics. They have students' debt, mostly in America, not here. Uh, for example, in Greece, we don't have that, but I have other friends in Europe that in some countries it is also a thing. Um, they have the post-pandemic uh, recession. They were young in the economic crisis of 2008, but they still experienced this in family. Um, and now they need something stable. They need to level up. They change careers. I have friends that work in big corporate firms, and next year they go to another place. They want a greater salary. Uh, they want better benefits. Uh, they want the next challenge. Uh, they want to do the best thing they could do. And they need flexibility. Um, work whenever they want. Uh, maybe travel. Um, work remote for some days. We do this in the office. Uh, sometimes I wonder who is in Thessaloniki. I have no <laughs> idea sometimes. All of the people are online and we can really uh, follow uh, all the projects uh, using cloud services and uh, the technology of today. So how uh, maybe workplaces and employees of the future will look like? <laughs> Wearables, robotics, AR, VR, vir virtual reality. Imagine somebody training someone else for a surgery using a VR glass, a VR uh, headset, sorry. Um, this is something that is already happening. Okay, imagine a car being driven on, on its own. Um, so this will create different demand for works, for work, different jobs. Um, maybe some of the things that are happening now will not happen in the future. Uh, maybe uh, cars will, for example, dri be drive driven uh, in their own on their own. Um, we need specialization. We need to know specific things. We need to be able uh, to fill with our skills the demand of specific projects. Um, it's the economy. That is a thing, but I don't know exactly where it is going. Platform economy is like I work in Uber, uh, for example. I work in Uber. Th this would make me a part of gig economy. Um, will this continue like that? Like uh, having freelancers, uh, drivers? Not. Uh, and this is a thing of how legal it is, or if they, sh they should be considered as freelancers or and work in that kind of uh, model, or if they should be considered as employees and being paid in a different way. Um, so non-standard form of employment, uh, part-time, full-time, maybe have two jobs, maybe have different sources of income. This is also happening today, hybrid model. Um, thoughts again, thoughts about the universal basic income, which is a discussion that is open. You may have heard this. Um, it's a concept that everybody in the world should be paid um, a minimum amount every month to be able to survive as a way to solve poverty. So what will happen if uh, there are not enough jobs because there we have too many automations and we need to specialize and we need to see the job uh, in a different way. International teams, this is also already happening and it's gonna happen even more. People from Greece, for example, are working for a company uh, from for Hungary which has a client from America and uh, they have in the same team people from other uh, places. Hybrid or rem remote jobs. I don't think we, sh we should uh, say more about this. Creative thinking, solution-oriented mindset in the teams of the future, um, especially when all these hard skills and uh, ba uh, things that a worker is doing today may be automated tomorrow. And soft skills is still a thing, being able to communicate in a thing. In a, in a group, I'm sorry, in a team of people. Love for lifelong learning and adaptability um, because everything is changing all the time, so we should learn how to learn, how to level up ourselves and how to go to the next step. 
And uh, uh, and this is important information management data analysis. So as it says over there, we cannot build the future for youth, but we can build the youth for the future. And I hope I helped a little bit for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ioannis. I was really charmed by the presentation. I forgot I had to moderate. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> um, it's impressive to, to see that there are all these, you know, chances ahead. But, uh, you know, we're still in the very beginning. We hope that this transition is going to be uh, normal and uh, soft for all of us. So I would like uh, to, to move to, to Ms. Muzaki, um, Mrs. Muzaki. Uh, last but not least, of course, and ask uh, after having heard the role of uh, the, the aspect of uh, academia, an aspect of business, an aspect of civil society. So I would like now to, to hear the aspect of decision makers and uh, uh, of what is uh, the role of decision makers in building new employment pathways and help young people adapt to all these conditions. Thank you. <laughs> This was impressive, and it's a bit hard to follow all these conversations, but <laughs> I'll try my best. So I'll start by perhaps sharing a little bit of my story, because I think it might give you a little perspective why I'm here, why what I'm saying, how I got to this uh, understanding, and why I got to be part of, and how I became a minister of youth and children. So a few, well, one year ago, I was sitting right where you're sitting, I was working for a private company, and I thought that the voice of young people was not heard enough in institutions. And I thought that politicians that were in the government didn't represent me. And they were, there were these people that were more the age of my parents, and they didn't really understand what being a Gen Y or a Gen Z or even somebody young meant. So this was my struggle. I thought, how do I fix this? Do I just like sit in a coffee place with my friends and I complain about how the people that are running us or what I pretty much generation of youth that is similar to me. Um, and actually after running I think there is something wrong with my you could use this yeah <laughs> sorry. It's a bit difficult. So we came to the part does this work? Yeah it works. Okay, so what I came up with was running as a member of parliament because I thought that we needed some representation from youth. And this was a few months ago. And now, actually, I'm minister of youth and children. So I think I got a little bit more responsibility than I asked for. But why I told you this story is because I think what's important, being head of an institution or even having institutions in themselves, is if you're not able to hear the voice of the targets that you represent and all of the people, then you're not doing a good job. So what I would like to do and how I would like to start this is by actually asking all the young generation of what is important for them. So I think from an institutional point of view, the first thing that I did when I got my, my new position is actually start a tour of consultations with the youth. I decided that I wanted to travel all around my country and ask them what was important to them. And you know what the first thing that I found out? is that they wanted to know more about job opportunities. I mean, they were really young, and I mean, they were 15, 16 years old, and the main thing that they were thinking about was the job opportunities that they had and what they could be in the future. So this is the first thing that I tackled, and I think you heard a little bit yesterday from Ognienin from RCC. He must have mentioned our first initial project. And the initial project is a bit related to how you make up the organizations, the civil organizations, together, and you bring them together with the institutions. And by working together, we're trying to figure out what is going wrong in our region from passing from schools to employment. So this was the first thing. And by talking to these young people, I realized that a few of them had the same perception. So what they thought is that their studying in school did not really give them an understanding of real life. Because, you know, they did do this uh, subject, which we call technology of information and communication. But when I asked them what are they learning there, and if they're actually digitally able and digitally skilled after learning that course, the answer was they weren't really. So this is where I figured out that perhaps we need to do a little bit more. And they told me that what they would like to do is have a little bit of a more interactive way of teaching the subject. 
So this is why I decided the first thing we needed to do is make sure that we taught them better skills that relate to real life. So as, as you mentioned before, and I'd like to go back to that point, the important part that we need to learn the young generation is actually how to critically think. Because if they have the ability to, to think critically about situations in their life, they don't need to know the solution to everything. So you don't need to know the answer to everything. You don't need to know which kind of career or which kind of job you're gonna choose in the future. You need to know the skills to adapt and the adaptability, sorry, adaptability and flexibility are actually the two skills that this new generation will need. Because we're always in this world that is constantly changing. And because the world is constantly changing, we need to adapt with it and walk with it. But I think I would like to disagree a little bit with one of the previous panelists. Uh, Elias mentioned earlier that youth is the future. Actually, I don't fully agree with that because I think youth is the present. I think for you now is everything you do is gonna be important. Because if we talk about issues like climate change, and if we talk about the environment, and if we talk about all these issues to, that to our generation are very important. To the previous generation, perhaps they haven't given it the right importance. So this is what I'm trying to say, that it's your time now. So this is the moment for the youth to be fully involved. And I think that the role that we have to share with each other is that we have to make sure that your voice is heard. So the role of the institutions has to be to make sure that you are involved in the policies that are drafted for youth. And your role on the other hand is to stand up and talk out loud and, well, not talk out loud, but make sure that you're heard and make sure that you say what you need. Because I think what's important to understand is that you know better what is necessary for you to adapt to a changing world. And be that technology in itself, be that the changing curriculum, be that better career guidance. I can talk here for, you know, until tomorrow to give you like different ideas of how we can make life better for the youth. But there is one ongoing stream of ideas in there and that is your involvement. And I think that's what we need most from youth. A youth that is active, a youth that is participating and a youth that is not afraid of being hurt. And as long as we manage to do that, I think you will be prepared for a technological future, for the changing world, and we will always be learning. Because I think that is something that COVID also taught us. That you don't have to be in an office with somebody to learn from them. You can always find new ways. So I think what kind of brings us together, our generation, is that we're very solution oriented. Like we're not scared to look for solutions. And as we have learned, we don't need to know the answers to everything, we have Google. So perhaps this is what we need to remember. But one thing I'd like to leave you with today is that institutions are only as strong as the people that they represent. So this is what, it's my final quote, so that's why I hope that all of you, in all of your countries, will, you'll make sure that you're always heard, because it's very important. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for your inspiring words. And uh, I keep your strategy that I was really impressed that the first thing that you did was uh, move around and listen to young people and uh, what their needs are. I wish that every decision maker could do that. Uh, it's a simple thing, but yet so hard to find. Uh, so now we can move on with uh, questions. We have plenty of time. So uh, whoever has can raise a hand and also ref uh, mention your name, please. I'm gonna try, okay, you can hear me. Okay, so hi, uh, my name is Denise, I'm coming from uh, Romania. First of all, I just wanted to thank you all. Um, this is the favorite part of the panel of discussion that I've been waiting for, and I can tell you I'm not disappointed at all. Um, I, as an HR professional, I also wanted to, to tell you that I stand by your uh, point of view on how the vocation will become less and less important while the skills of adaptability and uh, being able to learn quick, quickly will become crucial. Now, my question for you is, considering that youth is currently um, looking more and more into remote working and being like 
digital nomads and so on. Uh, what would you advise the employers that have this need of uh, controlling or they're struggling with uh, the new way of working and they have this maybe need of uh, feeling like they can you know, watch their employers sitting on a desk nine to five, just be there and not, even, not literally you know, giving better results or uh, contributing uh, for real. So what would you tell them while they're struggling right now? into making people coming back to the offices. Thank you. Uh, are, you are you addressing the question to some specific speaker? No, oh, whoever. I mean, can we, can you hear me? Is, is it okay? Uh, that's, uh, that's a, a very fine question. Um, what I would say to the employers is that um, they've already lost that battle. <laughs> it's a lost battle. Um, thi still thinking in 2021, after almost two years of uh, a, a very moving, strong, and um, challenging situation at many levels, I would say that the most important thing for any employer, or at least any modern employer that would want to continue to surpass this pandemic situation and continue to be successful, um, that they, that there, there shouldn't be a strategic thinking at all moving forward around how are we going to control our employees and how are we going to make sure that they work eight hours a day and that they don't, uh, that they uh, take over the, their backlog uh, regularly and that there are no tasks uh, outstanding, etc. I really personally think that's, that's a lost idea already and that it's a lost battle since if they if modern employers try to do that then they are going to lose the employees and um, employees from the way we are standing from the from where we are standing and from where i personally stand are our biggest asset in my company company in particular we don't have other assets except for the employees. Employees sit together, including senior management, including anyone working, sits in an open space, um, in an environment with no doors, which uh, previously we had, you know, in companies, an open door policy. It's, it's all gone under the table. It's a no door policy now. The company needs to be prepared and create an environment where employees will feel safe to come back, first healthy and safe, an environment where they'll be able to speak up around any ideas or more important, any concerns that they might have on uh, connecting to what I already said, for example, integrity and ethics and only by doing this a company will be able to maintain an, a, a balance between uh, what of course needs to be done of course what's the business and the 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 mindset and the setup and 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 the whole combination of working in, in working environment projects benefits um, private health insurance for example etc cetera, etc cetera, everything that that needs to get connected in order for employees to have trust in the employer and stay and um, move with their careers with that employer. Thank you very much for your answer. So, any other question?
Uh, do you hear me? Okay. Uh, so my name is Radovan, and I'm a law student from Montenegro. And I wanted to give a comment on the freelancing and job opportunities, but also would really uh, like to hear you out. Um, we all know that it started to be a tradition, not just in online jobs, which is a really a good opportunity, especially for, for younger people. But on Balkan, we have a sort of a tradition for physical jobs that people and firms are getting workers from other sides of the world where poverty is uh, in the rise, so they can get those workers for cheaper price. And that's also a thing with the freelancing, and that's a big problem because uh, on freelance and other platforms where especially youth can find a job even though they're in high school or whatever, but they have some skill. Um, that skill and their time requires to be paid, but who is gonna pay the normal price where you can find someone uh, in, let's say, a country where poverty is higher, let's say, some, some people from Malaysia, even though I'm just gonna say I don't have anything, ag anything against them, but it, it's sort of tra uh, starting to be a, a tradition. And that's why more and more people are not going that way. Uh, so, and one of the problems might even be that there's uh, no organization, so or in Balkan or even in our countries, that would help the people uh, in some way with some experiences and show them the path. And also, as the uh, Minister of Youth said, uh, and myself, because uh, this is not my first conference or seminar for youths, and where, wherever I was, the first thing I heard from the youths was, uh, that they want the job opportunities. And in my country, our own minister said that it's in the, uh, that one uh, particular activity or project is uh, in the works, and that's like um, summer jobs and, you know, like off-site uh, jobs for youth people when they can make some extra money. So I just wanted to even ask you now, uh, maybe you can answer if uh, it's to your knowledge that those projects uh, exist even in making or, or is something that even possible right now? Thank you. Uh, that's, that's actually a really good point. And it's true that job opportunities are always important to youth. I do think that there is a little bit perhaps of a mismatch between youth and businesses. And I would like to answer this before I give you like a right answer. At least in my country, in Albania, what I hear most from the youth is that they will come to me and say that there are no jobs. But on the other hand, I'll, I'll go to the businesses because before I worked a lot with businesses, so I have a, a, an understanding of how they work as well. And the majority of businesses were complaining for the same thing. They were complaining that they didn't have enough workers. So I think at least in Albania, there is a mixed match between the, the nature of jobs that are being requested and the nature of jobs that are being demanded. So that's the first thing. Uh, when to, to your second question in regards to the summer practices and summer internships, that's also something that we're doing in Albania. This was the sixth year that we did this, uh, this program of uh, job opportunities for the recently graduated. So everybody that, ha that has actually completed a bachelor, this is, they are given this opportunity to apply. And we're doing it both with public institutions and with the private sector. However, as of now, it's with very small and limited numbers. So we're trying to increase that. Because I think the biggest issue that we're facing with the youth is that they will finish university and somehow they have this perception that the first job that they will apply will be the, the right one. Which is always, you know, it's perhaps even a generational issue as well. That they're very used to, to thinking that it's going to be okay to apply to one job and then you get it. So it's also this understanding that they need to have a bit more experience before they get an actual job. So I think it's a matter of perception. So I think we have to change the mentality as well of applying for a job. Because at least in my experience, if I'm being personal here, I had to apply to 50 jobs to get, you know, like a few interviews and then eventually get a job. So this is also with the new generation as well, they have to understand that sometimes you have to start applying for jobs even before finishing your bachelor, applying for internships, getting some hands-on experience. I know it's a little bit unfair because when we think of the boomer generation, they had a job immediately after they finished university. But this is something that is changing for my generation, your generation, so we have to adapt. I go back to the same point. The adaptability is really important 
and adaptability comes from having an internship during school. So that's why to me, personally, I think it's really important to have such programs because it gives you the opportunity to even figure out more what's the kind of nature of, prof uh, of job that you would like to, to do and you would enjoy. I hope I answered your question. There are, there are quite a lot of you that want to ask things, so uh, you can start first because you have already a microphone and okay. there will not be a second I'll one. I'll try to keep it's it okay. short. Okay, nice. Okay. It's working. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentations. My name is Aldo. I come from Albania. I mentioned a bit yesterday uh, my idea of uh, all the programs tend to enhance political activism for the youth to be more market approached rather than politically approached in this reality now. And what I mean by that is that I like to, I like to, uh, the idea of promoting more programs that tend to equip young people with the skills that you just said. Because I think that this makes them more uh, acceptable for the big market. And what I mean by that is that the, these big companies that always need, need workers and are constantly evolving in the, in the current reality, like we saw from COVID. COVID had many bad things, but one of the, the good things that brought, it brought to the surface the new reality and the new kind of jobs that are, are required nowadays. And there are a lot of, 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 of workers that are being needed because uh, I made some researches on the market and there are big companies asking in the countries of the Western Balkans, young people with these different kinds of specific skills, mostly technologically and digital, but are not finding that much workforce. And as uh, Ms. Musashi said, young people need jobs. And once, in my opinion, once you, you, take you, get, you get that job, you are more... Uh, it's more possible that you become politically engaged. And this is the key for, in my opinion, then. If we have more a, a society where young people are more politically engaged, democracy will be stronger and the society will flourish, I think. My question here is to share from a governmental point of, po point of view and from business point of view, how can we push the buttons here in the system in order to enhance this thing? Like, what kind of project can we take for the young people to be like more market-oriented, to, to promote this kind of idea more, to push them a bit further to, to, to get these skills, and not just go to school and acquire an education and later have it really difficult to find a job? and be more ap apathetic. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's an awesome question. I fully agree. It was the first question I asked myself as well when I became minister. And I came up with three answers. The first issue that I found was career education. At least in Albania, we were lacking that. So, I mean, we have a curriculum and we do try and teach education, uh, the career choices and the kind of jobs that you can get, but I think we need it to be stronger and to be more aligned to the job market. So that's the first thing we need to do, to make sure that our youth and our children understand which are the kind of jobs that are in market demand, because they might actually impact the choices that you make when you go to university. Uh, the second element, which I'm hoping to pilot next year for Albania, would be uh, summer courses, so summer camps and summer camps which should be targeted to three different priorities. The first one, of course, in line with today's conversation, will be innovation. So those will be the opportunity for the, for the youth that are interested in innova innovative ideas and are interested in the IT elements. They'll get to go to the summer courses and make sure to figure out if that's a career choice that they would like to follow. The second one would be regarding arts and crafts. So the opportunity to figure out talents in those areas as well, because at least in Albania, I feel like we have sort of left behind the artistic pi part and the creative part. And the third one, which is also equally important, is the sports. Because of course, we can't have 
I know that for today's conversation, it feels like I'm talking about something alien, but it's sometimes difficult to, you know, it's, it's easy to forget when you're in your laptop and when you're in your computer, it's difficult to forget that healthy living is also something important. So I think it's important that we keep our youth a bit active and sportive as well. So that's why we also figured that out. And the third element, which is very important, is uh, better uh, is the when I mentioned before the curriculum in regards to learning IT and learning the future. I have to mention something that to me is important. I think for my age, it was it was really interesting to know new languages. So our skill was to speak different languages, and I think the whole region understands this. I think the most of this room speaks at least three languages. I think that's the bare minimum in our in our countries. But for this new generation and for the youth now, I think the coding languages are the new languages of the future. So I think if we start to invest on that from an early stage, and that is the plan, especially for Albania, and we want to make sure that from next year, the, from the first grade, we'll start teaching coding in school. Of course, there will not be coders at seven years of age, but they will know how to have those basic understanding of the coding languages. And I think this is something that for our whole region, not just for Albania, if we start producing coders, I mean, of course, we have tourism and we have all this natural beauty in our region, but I think our biggest asset, and I talk for all of you, because we have seen that our people, wherever they go, in the US, in the UK, in the rest of Europe, we're usually top performers. So I think our biggest asset, as Ilias mentioned earlier, very noteworthy, he said that our biggest asset are actually people. So I think we have to invest on three different areas. And hopefully they'll start paying off. But the investment is to start from two sides. So what I'm thinking is also from the first grade, but also from universities. Because you did mention a very good point when you said that the businesses now are looking for some sort of uh, job descriptions that actually we don't have the right courses at universities. So this is also something that we're working on to make sure that we can target our courses at universities to the job market needs. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, I, I, oh I, yeah, of course. Of course. Go on, please. Yeah. Um, so, just very quickly connecting to precisely um, what my colleague uh, just described. I believe that having a, a, a strategic relationship in one triangle that's connected between the the private sector the public sector and uh, meaning government and education as the third point is of the utmost importance for, for the question that you just posed. And it's a very important question that needs to be constantly asked. Why? It's because uh, when done properly, it creates an equilibrium between the skills, the available jobs and the preparedness of young people to be uh, to come out in the uh, on, on the job market and be successful if it's done spontaneously as we are very much aware um, um, it is in most of our countries to a higher or a lower level then it creates problem problems that are at least uh, mid-term let's say mid-term uh, being uh, uh, with damages of five to ten years, let's say, going forward, or long-term damages of ten plus years, when it's left that spontaneously to, to be developed. So, so that the connection, strategic connection, long-term connection of that triangle is, uh, in my opinion, of utmost importance. So, uh, does anyone else want to answer of the speakers? Okay, uh, so we already know three people that would like to make a question, so Andre, you can move on, yes. Do he, okay. Hello, my name is Daniela Gloschatz. Uh, I am a PhD student and research associate uh, at the Faculty of Law in Serbia. And I was listening quite carefully your presentation, but um, that's why I have 
comment and the question. I'm not sure uh, how much all this uh, is especially part about the dig digitalization is applicable on the public sector because in my country most of the public institutions doesn't even use email in 21st century for example courts or faculties i was uh, i had the opportunity to cooperate with the professors who don't use mail and um, nobody demands from them to gain that skills and um, uh, another question is uh, I don't know what is the situation in your countries but in my country when it, when it comes to freelancers they don't have health insurance and they um, uh, for example they uh, can't get the loan from the bank even though uh, some of them earn uh, much uh, more than someone who is employed in, for example, in some public institution or in, or in public company, uh, just because he doesn't have a permanent contract. And that's why if you don't have, if you can't get the loan, then you can't uh, buy apartment and um, uh, other uh, things. And that's why I don't know what do you think are the ways how we can uh, find solutions and for those problems that are obviously uh, quite big for young people. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you address the question to some specific, oh, whoever, uh, who would like to answer this, please? Okay, we can use this one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Okay, great. Um, so I will answer to the um, first uh, question regarding the uh, public sector and if the, all these digital age is uh, really something that could happen in the country. Um, the answer is yes, uh, it will happen someday. Uh, I mean, it happened in Greece. Uh, in Greece, we, had, we used to have a lot of paperwork, different services, different sectors, uh, many different things, uh, and it was really difficult to deal with all this stuff. Uh, but we, uh, last two years with COVID, we've done a great job as a country uh, for digitalization of the public sector. Um, I mean, when uh, I had to do the paperwork to begin the business, I got uh, approved uh, by the ministry, then I went to the tax office, I showed them uh, what I'm applying for, they took it in the computer, they printed it in paper, I took the paper, I went to the public insurance with the paper, they took it in the computer, <laughs> they printed it, and I took it again. <laughs> so now this is not happening. So uh, if, uh, if <laughs> um, I, ho I think that it will happen also in this country uh, when somebody's uh, ask, uh, putting some pressure for it. Um, it could be cooperation with other institutions. It could be somebody who is funding this process. It could be European Union or, uh, or even the citizens or uh, businesses being too digital for this public sector. Uh, the thing is that it will happen one day. Uh, what we could do to foster that change uh, would be maybe to educate employees, um, to give them motivations, um, because you know you cannot ask from people who grew up in a different way and got out a different job to do everything. You cannot ask them to do things that they don't know and don't give them away. So um, we should give uh, information systems that make sense that are user friendly, uh, but you know better uh, how to answer for this thing. Uh, we should uh, give them systems that make sense, we should uh, inspire them to use them, and we, we should educate them. Um, it's like we, uh, we give a teacher uh, a class, for, uh, a big class of children, and we don't give them books, we don't give them training, we don't give them guidance, we don't give them materials to work, we don't give a whiteboard, it's not gonna work. Uh, so, um, people in the public sector need the resources and they need training. And this is a political decision, but we can uh, also, uh, what you were saying before is really important, that if we uh, believe and we ask the pressure, 
uh, it's going to be easier and faster. So, uh, any remarks on the second question? Okay. Okay. The, free, the freelancer question. <laughs> well, I don't know how it is in, it is in every country. Um, the thing you're mentioning uh, with freelancers not having an insurance could be because in uh, some countries uh, freelancers are not officially doing business. They don't have paperwork, tax uh, insurance, so that's why they're not having the insurance. But uh, when they're not officially into business. But when somebody, a, at least in Greece, I'm talking about Greece, when somebody is in business, in business and has something uh, in his own name, an institution and a tax number, he is um, able to have the insurance and uh, do all the normal things that a business or an individual can do. Uh, the question is, if I get it right, why uh, many people prefer not to have a business and just uh, take money, uh, sell products without uh, tax um, illegally? Well, when uh, you, you can answer better maybe about policies and things like that, but uh, when uh, the policy is too, ta uh, too tight, how can I say it, and too hard, and you have high taxes, you have, uh, it's like you, you are a partner with the government and you share the revenue. So m that's why maybe many people don't prefer that. But, I but it's on the government, it's in the business, uh, uh, the type of the business that you run, it's too many things and I cannot uh, fully cover. I'll, I'll add just something really quickly. Like on your first question that you made in regards to the digitalization, unfortunately that's one that's usually a political decision. At least in Albania, the way how we did it, uh, our government took a decision that we wanted to have all services online. And this is how we started. We started with approximately 100 services that we had online and now we have a thousand and something. So this is something political. This doesn't mean that what I mentioned in the beginning of my talk is not important because of course you can lobby to your politicians, you can lobby to your members of parliament and it is your role as well to make sure that you want a more digital country. And I think I would hope that with COVID you even went further in the digitalization. I don't know the specifics to your country, but at least for us, we even added more services during COVID. And I think we're actually doing really well in that regards, but this is something that it has more of a political connotation. It's something that it has to come from policies, but you can always you know, lobby to make sure that that happens. Uh, in regards to freelancers, I think that's very much, I'll, as, I'll answer that as an economist, I won't answer that as a minister. It depends a lot on the tax legislation that you have in your country. At least in Albania, we have pretty much the same legislation in regards to freelancers and to a small business. So that's why in Albania they don't have much differentiation in terms of taxes, in terms of registration, in terms of uh, how they operate. But this is also country specific. So it depends on the way that you treat them. Of course, freelancers usually tend to be not registered, as you very adequately mentioned. And in the case that you're not registered, of course, you can't get access to you know, health security and you can't get access to the bank. But in case you're registered, and I think it's very similar in Serbia as well, like provided that you're registered and that you operate functionally and you have like steady contracts and that everything is done uh, as per the tax offices, I think you should be able to get the same kind of treatment. Like that's, at least in Albania, like they're very similar. As long as you register, you should be able to get all those benefits. Thanks. Uh, I, I would like to hear actually the opinion of all speakers on this, uh, this topic because it's also a political one as uh, we, we mentioned before. So please, uh, Mr. Gusbotinov, and then we're going to Mr. Kratolica. Thank you. Um, on, on the point of languages, hvala na pitanju, Daniela. Odlično pitanje. Uh, Multistrukturno multi pitanje. Um, be working now. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to add one very important point is that when we're discussing freelancers and uh, the, the issues around freelancing and taxation um, and, and how, the, how one country can set up a system to, 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 to deal with that and make that happen, one important thing that we haven't mentioned is that 
most freelancing or at least one of the most important uh, reasons why someone freelances is because they don't see how people not freelancing actually add value to the quality of life. As we are standing, most of us, uh, myself being 20 or 30 years older than, than, than some of you, we mainly stand in front of the same problems around us as we stood 25, 30 years ago. And this is, uh, this is very worrying. And young people um, s starting thinking about starting a business or thinking about uh, working like a freelancer for a foreign uh, contractor uh, somewhere in the United States, for example, or in Canada or in Sweden, and uh, taking their salary um, through tax evasion um, is, is an option because they are not seeing how their taxes would add value to their quality of life here where they live. And, and that's something very important that the state actually in each of our countries needs to work on for them to understand, but not only to understand, to see it actually happening, at least um, at, at some level. And at that point, we can discuss if it's tax evasion or if it's uh, someone not believing in the system where, where they are present. Um, Mr. Kertolce. So the thing here that I would like to stress out is that the digitalization is going to happen in our countries too, sooner or later is going to happen. It's going to happen sooner if we press as a citizens, if we press our political authorities. Several times it was mentioned that is a political decision. It is a political decision, but the political decision is going to become reality if we as a citizens press the need. Uh, if we do not uh, raise the problem, the problem is going to stay here. So the thing here is that you as a youth, you must press for a solution. You must speak, you must raise your voice. Uh, what is very important here is when we teach about how the citizens and why the citizens are not pressing their political authorities about problems, we usually teach about political culture. The political culture is the most important thing, how the citizens are reacting to the political reality. If you possess participative political culture, and if you expect from your government to do the digitalization, the, the, the digitalization will come sooner. So the thing here, what uh, according to me, when we speak about not just digitalization, but the whole outcome of the political system, the whole outcome of the political authorities, the thing is that we must press them for more solutions, for more decisions that are going to make our life easier especially if you live in the Balkans. System is not going to be changed if the citizens do not press for changes. And I, what is very important, I see change in the political culture, especially when we speak about the youth, but we must do better. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we can move on to the next question. And then we have two more. Mike, can you hear me? Amazing. Uh, firstly, thank you so very much for holding this uh, very inclusive and uh, interacting uh, panel. I think for me, it, it was one of the most interactive ones so far. So firstly, thank you very much. And I think this uh, this gives me the power to grab the microphone just to raise my opinion and share my opinion and not even ask a question. 
so forgive me for that in advance. <laughs> uh, I want to go throughout five points, but stressing out the digitalization process and sharing good practices. I, will go on, I want to go through COVID-19, education, democracy, digitalization, and lastly, but very important for me, Estonia, okay? Um, COVID-19 was like a bomb for us, right? No one was waiting for it, and it was one of the main factors that indicated for us and didn't ask us, do you want to change? It just made us change, right? And I, I believe that this was the, the most power that uh, changes happened during COVID-19, right? Because you would have another opportunity, uh, the physical one, as we had in most cases, like with other viruses before that were, that were easier to handle, we didn't go through digitalization processes that mass, right? We, we still find, find out uh, ways to basically help everything in physical ways. Even after we, we started knowing or getting, getting together a bit more with COVID-19, we started uh, creating these hybrid formats just to see one another and, and be there for one another, which is totally fine because we, we said, uh, uh, Mr. Mario told us that in a society world, we need individuals and we need to, to see one another. Uh, but I think that COVID-19 gave us this need to change. Ex for sure, you need to change it because there is no other way. And I, I believe this is the power that COVID-19 had. And let's see how we can use this power to basically improve our digitalization process even further. And what do I mean regarding that? Uh, we had uh, two main problems that we discussed throughout this panel. It was education throughout COVID-19 and the democracy. And none of them use the technology or the digitalization as they should have. For instance, there was this case in uh, the parliament of Kosovo at the beginning of, of COVID-19. Uh, only one of the participants, one of our deputy, deputy leaders, uh, was in the process of quarantine. And there was this uh, session uh, of, of parliament wanting to be held in time of COVID. And none of them thought of uh, joining that deputy through hybrid format and the others going to the parliament. So what they did, they just postponed the meeting, okay? And that's not democracy, right? That's not trying to find forms to basically uh, save the democracy. Or in other formats, uh, we had uh, basically police forces uh, giving out detentions because you were going out of uh, out of the, the time you, you were supposed to do, but legally speaking, nobody asks the citizens, when do you want to do this, or do you want to do this form? And it was very easy to do it throughout the digitalization uh, forms that we have, right? It was very easy in, in, our, in our COVID time to basically uh, open up a survey and see what the citizens are thinking, okay? Same for elections. We have America that has digitalized the process of, of voting uh, for several years now, and then we in Europe and Balkan, we're not doing that yet, right? And we don't know why we're not doing that yet. When it comes to digitalization, I think that uh, the force that I was mentioning about the COVID-19 that didn't ask us if you want to do it, I think that uh, the politic, the government, should do it throughout the law, all right? Uh, giving out options uh, in Kosovo didn't work. Uh, we have a uh, digitalization process that we can use, but we also have the physical ones. And while we're giving out the options to choose between digital or physical, everybody's using the traditional format, right? They're not going through the new changes because it's not asked to do it seriously. Like, don't. If you're giving out the options, we are always choosing the comfort zone. So I believe that one of the, the striking points that should happen in digitalization shall be the law changement in, in, in that matter and not giving a second options beside digitalization. Of course, uh, digital signature, uh, digital uh, format or, or mechanisms of uh, communicating with the government and citizens uh, portals, as the ministry just mentioned, that give out, a, uh, let's say, administrative uh, process that citizens can use and they don't need to go to the municipality in local level or to the government to raise a request or to, uh, to get a document are very important in, in this space. 
Lastly, um, uh, there are some lots of good practices that uh, we can intake from other countries in order to even better uh, go through the process of digitalization. That's why I said that it's very important for me to talk about Estonia, uh, but not only that, but Estonia is like the highlight of the, of the changes in digitalization. Estonia is uh, in Europe, not a, such a very big, big country, but it was able to create basically every process uh, on government in, in a digitalized way. Uh, just to, to share maybe some uh, in, in interesting information, uh, in Estonia, when uh, a citizen calls the ambulance, uh, throughout the way from hospital to his or her house, they already know everything that they had in their past health, uh, their family's health, uh, if they have any allergies, and up until the point that they get to the patient, they already have the shearing on their hand. So basically the reaction time on crisis is it's very easy. And in the other hand, there are, uh, the Estonia has one simple rule when it comes to digitalization of the process in the, our government. Uh, we only ask you once. So basically when, you, when you're born, you get this number ID, uh, which is your name in the government. And no one ever is gonna ask you to send me an ID and then uh, your name, your father's name, your mother's name, your ID card, you, all of them are in your ID. So this is very fruitful for the citizens when they say that uh, it only takes us 50 seconds to pay the taxes, right? So all of that free time they now have as citizens uh, indicated for them to uh, be more culture-wise, uh, deal more with arts, sports, which indicates a better mental health of the whole uh, country. So uh, I think it's very interesting to see uh, good practices that uh, other countries use. I think Macedonia was one of them as well that uh, decreased the taxes on technological equipments uh, when you're buying them, uh, like basically in the Doga uh, customs, uh, you, you need to pay way more. And I think that really indicated in the Macedonian uh, digitalization process as well, because when it came to breakdown or lockdown of the uh, students and other citizens in their houses, most of them had their laptops in their house because they weren't that expensive to buy. Uh, or they had phones, uh, they had smartphones, which is very important. And the penetration of internet all over the country also helped it even further in, in that part. So to, to finish, because I took more time than needed maybe, uh, I think it's very important for our governments, especially in our uh, region, in Balkan, to see other good practices from other countries, use them in our countries, and thus, of this way, uh, creating a bigger market place through remote working and freelancers, uh, because we don't have the European Union. Uh, <laughs> we don't have those, those uh, benefits of working and uh, going to, to other countries. So in, in, digital, uh, in the digital world, uh, we don't need visa and we don't need to, to pay fee transports, we just need to have the internet and the mindset and the will to do so. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Yes, of course, you can comment on this. Just a couple of weeks ago, there were actually experts in technology from Estonia visiting uh, Skopje, several governmental agencies to share knowledge. And there uh, could be um, a project elaborating on that into uh, using their experience, uh, their knowledge, and how they, uh, how they actually succeeded into digitalizing their, um, <laughs> uh, their political system. So, so successfully and so completely as they have. So, uh, I was also very, personally, I was very happy to, to hear that uh, they've come and uh, there's, uh, there's already an initiative around that to, to gather the no their knowledge and try to, to implement it uh, here locally. Okay, uh, I also need to add something. I mean, you said a lot, we all had to add things. Um, thank you for your uh, remarks, as uh, Anna mentioned. 
uh, I, I agree with what you already said. It's important that uh, we as humanity found these good practices, so let's share and uh, let's help everybody evolve. Um, one small point on why maybe um, a, a system could be both physical and digital and giving the option, this could be a transition um, phase. I mean, even, for example, even wh when you do a rebranding in a company, you may for a short period communicate with both colors and have a transition uh, phase so that people won't be shocked. Uh, also, it may be a testing period and see what's not working well or uh, what other needs uh, will, uh, uh, will show up for elderly people uh, using digital aids. Or uh, if in that way you may uh, be um, isolating people who, who have bad internet access or um, maybe other difficulties. So, and it's also o always a big thing, the data, the, the, pri uh, the general data protection. Um, so, I mean, I'm giving you the number. When I log into the Greek uh, system and uh, I use my password uh, and I visit, for example, the attack service, it always asks me, hey, John, do you uh, give uh, your, uh, do you consent? Uh, so tax have access to your personal data or not? So um, users somehow in Estonia accepted the terms and uh, all the doctors know their data anytime they call the ambulance. But this is deeper than uh, doing it in one day, but this is what should, should go. I, it just needs some time uh, to adopt the good practice. So I uh, thank you very much. Oh, of course, of course, of course, please. I think Yanis actually covered what I was going to say as well. It, it involved a lot of that, but the way I'd, I, I think you shouldn't go as, like, as far as Estonia. Of course, Estonia is a perfect example, but for instance, Albania currently in the region is doing very well in digitalization. The way we did it was not completely as you mentioned, so not <laughs> immediately take off everything physical. So we did have a transition period, but of course it wasn't easy to get to those physical points. So it didn't, it didn't used to be as easy as before to put a little bit of a motivation for the people to use the electronic one. And then of course we got a bit lucky in, you know, parenthesis, because COVID made it impossible to go to the physical points. So I think that's why, you know, it was both a little bit of preparation because we were ready to implement a new online system. And at the moment COVID hit, it was impossible not to do it any other way. So I think it was a little bit of both. And in terms of, uh, you did mention before on policies that can make it easier for digitalization. Something we did in Albania is to reduce the taxes for companies working in IT. So actually we have it 15% for everybody else and for IT companies producing software and uh, you know the hardware as well, it's 5%. So that's something that can make the, the whole population go towards that area as well and be more digitally inclined. Thank you very much, uh, the three of you, for the answer. Um, oh, I think, uh, mi Mr. Kartolicev, yeah. would you like yeah, to add yeah. something? Please. Yeah, I would like to add something, because the question regarding the democracy was raised and regarding the voting, regarding the uh, parliaments also. I would like just to add several comments. Um, I completely agree regarding the parliaments. If you analyze, after the COVID-19 outbreak, outbreak, almost all Western democracy decided immediately to change the rules of procedures and to adopt rules which are going to uh, open the floor for virtual sessions. Our countries here, they decided to stay careful. And usually we decide to stay careful about topics that are pretty much easy to conclude that is okay, but we are not staying careful regarding the topics that are far from okay. So when it comes to the parliament, definitely, the Balkans are not following good examples coming from the Western democracies. If, if we go more deeply right now, the Western democracies are preparing more and more regarding the virtual sessions of parliaments. They are trying to find ways how the virtual sessions can be followed by interactions, by applauses, by the MPs, by ooh from MPs, just to give some kind of um, 
uh, life inside the virtual parliaments. So I agree completely with you that the Balkan states are not following good examples when it comes to the uh, parliaments, virtual session of parliaments. When it comes to voting, here I must say that we must be very careful because voting process, uh, you need just one thing to compromise the whole process. And the thing with the voting by post, the thing uh, with the voting by uh, email and so on and so on, the problematic idea here is how to protect the secrecy. You need to provide secret ballot in order to protect the voters from the political actors. And here in the Balkans, political actors are almost finding ways how to influence voters in their decisions. How to, uh, are trying to find a way, are trying to find a way to, uh, to give impression to the citizens that they know how the citizens are going to vote. And through that, to put pressure on voters. So why I'm, uh, why I'm uh, specifically stressing the point about the voting, even in the United States, the Donald Trump was trying to find a way to compromise the whole electoral process because of the voting through mail. So the thing is that even in the United States, they had a problem regarding the, this issue, but still, they possess stable institutions and stable institutions can provide reassurance to the citizens that the process went according to the rules. I'm not pretty sure about the institutions on the Balkans. And I always, when I teach about elections, I always say that it's not just important to have elections. It is important the process of elections. If you compromise the process of elections, nothing good will come out. The legitimacy of the winner is going to be undermarked. So that is the reason I'm completely behind the idea that virtual parliament, the idea for virtual session, the idea for virtual debates is a great one, but I'm not still sure that voting, for example, is a good choice. Maybe I'm still conservative on that point, but I'm concerned that the whole process can be complicated completely. So uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, your additional remarks. And uh, I think that we have about 40 minutes till the end of this plenary session. So I'm going to take uh, a bunch of questions now for the speakers. Uh, Eleni, I think it's your turn. You can start uh, from here and then we're moving on. Yes, I think it works, okay. So hello to everyone and thank you for your speeches. Uh, my name is Eleni, I'm from Greece. And I have a, a comment and a question about something from a different perspective, about the perspective for the education part. So until we got to the, uh, I mean, of course, technology created new jobs. And, but until we uh, reach to the job, we have the education. So, and at least in Greece, like, education is not linked to the labor market. Like when I was in the university, I was using a very old PC using a program that no one uses it right, right now. So shouldn't like the education be directly connected to the labor market? Shouldn't like modernized? Or like if it's completely synchronized, the educational system with the labor market wouldn't change the labor market as we know it now. Because if more people are right, um, if more people right, are educated on the field, like as they should be on, now on the um, um, demands that we have now would also create new jobs and would change the labor market as we know it now. And also like I, I have many friends, they have a bachelor degree in Greece and they're going to England or in other countries to have a master degree because in Greece there is no such education for what the labor market asks now. So how can we connect it? How 
what we can do. So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Eleni. Um, I think we can move on with uh, with the next question. Uh, th there was uh, some lady here in the. Oh, would you like to make the question? Yes, please. Good. Okay, then uh, I'm Simona. I was student uh, in the Faculty of Law Primaries, Justian uh, Janus Primarius in Skopje. Marco was my professor, and now I'm a cybersecurity analyst, and I gained a set of skills outside of my formal education during my studies and after my please. studies little closer because we cannot hear you very well. Uh, and after my studies. So uh, I would like to point out uh, when thinking about technology, I cannot differentiate it from uh, reshaping the educational system. Why uh, two aspects here are very important for youngsters. Why youngsters are willing to be, uh, to party to participate in political parties, to find jobs, or to shape the society. Uh, because as we can see, yeah, we have a lot of young people in Macedonia that are in power, but we cannot see the impact of that. And from the other aspect is, uh, th I'm blaming the government, because uh, I think that they are uh, not doing anything to change the curriculums of the educational primary educational system and secondary, especially. Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, another question. So, uh, okay, okay, go on, please. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Arnor. I'm from Kosovo, and I represent iChat Institute. And I would like to add a comment uh, for jobs in my country. Kosovo, there had uh, no divisions of work profiles. So, for example, uh, if you work as an engineer, uh, you if you you have to complete the responsibilities of engineers, but uh, you have to do extra jobs for that uh, company. So, I would like uh, kindly ask uh, Mr. John Harhas how we can find a solution for division of work profiles. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. Please. Uh, okay, uh, we, we have we have two people, right? So, uh, Marcel, I think you're first. You can go. Okay, three people. Go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Marcella. Um, I wanted to say that um, that we are speaking about digitalization and as if it was definitely a wonderful thing. But I would say that COVID especially underlined the digital disparities in everywhere basically so like we are forgetting our parents for example or our grandparents and i found myself like helping my parents during this digitalization so to i don't know go to pay taxes or everything so i feel like also it's not just about generation disparities also like in my own country say italy like from the north to the south like the difference is huge so in the north, everyone is like, oh, we have three laptops per person. And in the south, people are just like desperate because they cannot go to school, which is like a fundamental right. So I don't know. Digitalization is good, but also it's not something that you have to throw and then just go away. And like the government should also like f give like f fundamental things like, OK, I want to do a reform, but also I have to make sure that everyone can s follow this. And then um, about um, education. I think like the problem is that like 50 years ago like the education is very old so 50 years ago we wanted to have jobs like very repetitive and these jobs have been um, substituted by machines because machines can be repetitive and now the jobs that we should uh, go towards are the jobs that we can do with like empathy and critical thinking because then machine cannot kind kind of take over these jobs because they are not able to 
critical think or um, feel empathy, but instead like we are still um, educate our youngsters to do repetitive jobs and put things in Excel tables. I think, what do you think about that? So, okay, I, I, will I can use another question for now and then we're going for a second branch of questions, not to confuse uh, the speakers as well, if you don't mind. So, uh, who would like to be next? Okay, uh, okay, you can go. Okay, it works. Uh, I'm Ivan Kulin from Bulgaria. Uh, and my question is uh, uh, how to save our um, soft skills during COVID and uh, yeah, home office and everything. Uh, I'm software engineer uh, with a little bit hardware profile. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm working from, let's say, one year and a half from mostly from the home. And uh, I'm feeling that uh, partially I'm losing my soft skills. Uh, and uh, yeah, my team uh, is uh, probably 20 or 30 people. And uh, yeah, the, the job is... Uh, uh, more hard to be maintained at the same level uh, because uh, at least we forgot uh, who is responsible for what and uh, it's not so easy to uh, yeah to, to co-working from home and yeah uh, this is the the question how to maintain our soft skills and uh, to to maintain the the team uh, build it as before in the home, in the open space, and uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, the second is more uh, like a comment uh, about the freelancer. Uh, yes, uh, the freelancer are not uh, so respected from the banks and uh, yeah, uh, maybe government and uh, society. Because uh, for the freelancer, it's more easy to not the, not paying the taxes and everything. Uh, uh, but there has uh, opportunity to stay, uh, yeah, uh, well represented. But uh, you need to pay for this. Uh, you need to pay for stability. Uh, and um, one of the possibilities is... Uh, uh, these contractors uh, companies you can go there and uh, be on contract with this uh, company and uh, uh, to work as a freelancer but you're on contract and uh, you're represented uh, to the government by these companies at least in Bulgaria and most of the European country uh, yeah this is more as a comment for the freelancers. Thank you. Uh, any of you can start? If you remember, we have some questions about education. So who would like to speak about this uh, first and the adaptation of education? OK. Uh, I can um, try revolving around the first question and the last question on soft skills. Uh, on the first question, I'll need to come back to the triangle. So, um, again, I really strongly believe there needs to be uh, a deliberate direction, a deliberate alignment between the private sector, education, and the state, where they strategically, in an agency or in a committee of some sort, uh, strategically cooperate together and align upon uh, the needs uh, of the market, the needs of the state on uh, the, the, the scope of education and, and the variety of education and um, the needs of the skills that are particularly necessary, the, 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 the expertise and the skills that's particularly necessary f for that particular job market. So that uh, strategically that needs to work but at the same time there are other things that we can do 
and we are doing a lot of uh, separate um, agreements for cooperation, agreements for understanding with uh, particularly in my, uh, 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 in our industry, uh, with any faculty and university that uh, works on IT related staff. So it's not only engineers, but uh, there's also business analysts and project managers, etc. And we really deliberately work and dedicate our attention to, to these programs that we agree upon, uh, meaning mentorship programs, meaning in some cases sponsorship programs. But uh, in my experience, the main thing, the most important thing in that direction was for, uh, uh, for not the companies, but the knowledge from the companies, meaning uh, mentors, heads, project managers, etc., to be present frequently in, the, uh, in education, meaning mostly higher education in this case. But I fully support the notion that we need to be much more present uh, into primary and secondary education because, um, uh, and I, I, I was really impressed by what the minister mentioned uh, concerning uh, their plans uh, in, in Albania to, to start that uh, logical thinking uh, about coding from a very young, young age. And yes, logical thinking, critical thinking, engineering and uh, IT literacy, technological literacy, let's put it that way, is highly important if we want to be successful in the world that, uh, that's coming or we can say it's already present. Um, so that's, that's what I, I, I would say uh, in, on, on the first question and on the last question, uh, I particularly uh, liked the point on, on soft skills. Um, mental health and being able to freely and eloquently communicate is something uh, that's, uh, that, that's, that's part of us. That's part of what uh, uh, the professor mentioned in the beginning, that that's part of us being humans. And we, we cannot, I believe, uh, really be successful in life without a level of soft skills. And the, uh, this pandemic situation created a very challenging time for uh, us developing and even maintaining our current soft skills. But um, we can also do a lot in this direction. So even before pandemic times, for example, in our company, I personally initiated a public speaking club. So a club where we, uh, uh, with members, with active members, where we discuss, where we debate, where we put topics on the table, where we have teams uh, with the pro and the con uh, defending the pro and the composition on a, on a, on a topic, etc., etc., et all revolving around proper uh, speaking and proper communication. But then also, within pandemic times, uh, we developed something uh, called, uh, uh, an initiative called We Care. And within this initiative, there's, there's a piece called Wellbeing. And Wellbeing is, a, uh, is an initiative comprised of soft skills, communication, yoga, meditation, and all of these uh, activities, activities and skills that can help us uh, be true, stay true to ourselves in these challenging times, and at the same time, try to at least maintain what we already had uh, as a way of communicating um, and, and even be uh, notorious and try to add upon that in a very structured and deliberate way. Uh, our teams also have started in small numbers coming back to the office. So even in, in an environment when we have um, remote work as the default, it's possible for companies and teams to have uh, a setup like we do today here at this conference, to have a setup where they will be able to meet one or two days per week um, and really continue from uh, where they stopped with that 
spontaneous communication and having coffee together, going to breakfast together, having stand-ups, scrum stand-ups, for example, together. So uh, it's possible, but it really needs initiative by the companies and by the people at the same time. Of course. OK, uh, great, you can hear me. Um, I really admired what uh, you mentioned about the company culture and how we maintain our uh, health balance, uh, life uh, profession balance actually. Um, there are small things that even a smaller company can do because uh, your company is a big, uh, a big one with many employees. So the, uh, you may be thinking that, okay, how can we do that in a small company where, of where we are only four employees, eight employees? Uh, we are, I think, for till with the interns, we could be eight employees, something like that. Uh, we have breakfast in the office once per week. Uh, it's simple. Uh, we, uh, and I mean, we don't have any specific uh, venue for the breakfast, uh, a different place for meetings. It, no, it's a small office. We are a small team. And we can still do these kind of small things uh, that help us uh, be together and cooperate um, and uh, meet one another outside uh, the business, our business roles. Um, it's uh, also really important regarding the um, uh, soft skills, uh, the digital soft skills and uh, the cooperation and all this stuff, that a remote uh, job, a remote working is not that you work on your own. You're still a part of a team, so you still communicate. You sti I know it's more difficult and um, mo many people prefer to uh, talk in person and communicate in person. I'm, I am one of these people. Um, but still, uh, we need to have a process. We need to have a, um, a structured communication so we can all uh, have the space and the time to express ourselves. And this is also a part of uh, the one who is leading the team. Uh, for example, if, if you have a Zoom meeting with your partners and you don't talk even for one minute in one hour, uh, you feel like you were not meant to be in that meeting. Even if you gained all this useful information, even if you are in this project, but you don't really talk, uh, you don't participate actively, uh, then you feel like, uh, why did I join this uh, meeting at first point? Why didn't I just continue doing my job? So um, the person driving the company or the team or the project should take care uh, to uh, bring you closer uh, to uh, your teammates and um, create an environment where you can express yourself, either it is digitally or physically or in a hybrid model. Um, and that, that's a good practice that um, was mentioned before. Um, I also uh, like this, uh, the question was about uh, how we can do the things that are only in our role, actually. Is this a question? Okay. Um, so. Uh, this is a bit uh, difficult sometimes in smaller company. Uh, for example, uh, there is a, we have an employee whose job is web design development, but he's not a f he ca you cannot be a full stack developer. Uh, you know what it takes. He's just using WordPress and he has a specific things of um, uh, what he has to do. He has speci specific jobs. So website creation, Sounds like, okay, I will use Wix, I will use WordPress, I can do it on my own. Yes, you can, but it has web design, it could be ha it have web development, search engine optimization, uh, UX, UI. It has 100 things, but it's one person because we are a small business. So, um, and uh, this is what the business can support, and this is what the employee for this specific time wants and needs. He wants to gain these stimuli and uh, see how each of these things, um, how can I say, reacts, how he reacts to each of these uh, things and what he likes more and what he likes less. And this is okay for the moment. So um, if he was in a bigger company, he, uh, where we had different section for uh, sector for SEO, different sector for UX, different sector for uh, performance of the website, then maybe he would be only performance specialist or SEO expert or something like that. Uh, so it is a thing of where you work, does this place have the capacity um, to give you one specific thing? Do you want to do one specific thing? Is this good for you? Maybe you want to gain, uh, to see 
other things. This will uh, broaden your uh, horizons, if I say it right. Um, it will help you uh, develop if you also do other things. So this is, uh, think of your personal balance and needs and the job offer. Uh, normally, in the first job, normally, usually, uh, in the first job, it's not the perfect thing. I mean, it is step by step. We go step by step. So in the beginning, it's OK to uh, go and uh, have two or three or four things you have to do in one role if it is a small business. And day by day, see what you're good at and what you love more and uh, go to that direction. Uh, for people who are managing a team, we have to do many things anyway. <laughs> um, so this is in you. One last comment. Uh, I, I like really the point with the uh, education, how it is connected to the labor market. Um, yes, education should be connected with the labor market. I have a personal questioning on uh, whether university on its own should be always connected. Uh, because a university is not a, a training institution only to give you a hard skill. University is a place for scientists. You go and study in depth a topic. You love something you want to do, something you want to learn. Maybe uh, it could be a faculty that has a very a big, um, uh, a very broad topic. Uh, for example, mine was applied informatics. We had business administration, marketing, programming, uh, software and technology. We had plenty things. Um, university should be a place for you, that's my opinion, uh, should be a place for you to learn this specific topic, uh, to study in depth, and if you only need to find um, a skill for the labor market, there are plenty of other training offerings, certifications, shorter um, uh, educational programs. It could be uh, certified, again, not uh, just a seminar or not uh, an, a guy on a Udemy course. Okay, uh, you, you could find official uh, trainings and, and uh, courses that will help you with this. So it's not only university, but that's my opinion. Oh, okay, so if I get it right, it's uh, uh, technology is just a way to approach the science you have already been trained to, and it's not something that has to be taught in uh, uh, universities in the first place. Like, you know, if we have to also explore our choices in informal paths. Mm -hmm. uh, of uh, education. So, okay, I, I think we can also have some comment on Marcella's um, que question about, uh, you know, age gaps and about the repetition. And uh, I would also like to have the opinion of Mr. Kertolic after that, please. I would like just uh, to add comment uh, to one question that was raised dedicated to the education, right to education, digitalization, and COVID. Uh, previously, during, uh, during the discussion, we mentioned comfort zone. Right now, the, uh, for example, if we speak about universities, the digitalization is offering comfort zone for us as a teachers, as a professors. Why? Because we can do our jobs from home, we can do our classes from home. It offers us more freedom. It offers us more time to do domestic things to, uh, and other uh, things connected to the, to, the, to the kids, to the home, to maintaining your home. And in the same time, to perform your job tasks. So right now, if you analyze, I'm pretty sure that many professors are going to say that they're in favor of digital classes than classes inside the lecture room. That's not the good thing. Com I, uh, it is my personal opinion that we as a professors, you as a students, we must get back to the lecture rooms as soon as possible. It is my experience that the students that got the classes inside the lecture room got better education than 
the students that got education only through Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and so on and so on. So yeah, digitalization is a good thing, but just sticking to digitalization, it's not option. It is my personal opinion that critical thinking, you cannot make, you cannot teach critical, uh, critical thinking just through internet. You need live contact. It is very important. The magic of the lecture room cannot be replaced. So not just for the primary and secondary uh, school and education, also for universities, it is very important not to stay in the comfort zone and the digitalization process, I think it's offering comfort zone for us as teachers. Uh, it was raised another question regarding about the youth and political parties in our society. As I see, we have two choices. The first thing is that the youth inside the political parties must press for changes inside the political parties. So it is very important not just to get into the political party and to be loyal supporter, but to criticize, to ask questions, to raise dilemmas and to ask for more. That's the first thing. Institutionally, maybe we can think about introducing quotes. For example, in our society, when we are electing MPs, we have a quotes for females. Maybe we can think and maybe we can press for a solution that are going to uh, increase the number of youths inside the MPs and inside the political institution. But again, I must say that the most important part is always to put the pressure, especially if you live in a system that is not described as a democratic, but as a hybrid one. You must put the pressure always, always, always. That is my uh, advice to you. Ms. Mzaki, please. Actually, I'll actually start with exactly where the professor left it off, because I think you made the very important point. You did mention in part of your question, you said, is it being part of a political party a job, or is it a job to get in there? And I think it's, it's, it's a very important difference there, because I think, at least in Albania, if I can speak for my country, which I know a little bit better, is what happens often is that you'll get this youth joining political parties with the hope of getting a job in the future. And I think if you're, if you're in that position, then you can't really disagree or criticize that much because you're in there to get a job, so you want to be nice to your boss. I mean, I'm saying that with a bit of joke inside, but it's kind of the gist of the idea. So perhaps what we need to, what we need to inspire more is the youth that has a job that is safely secured in its own position and decides to join a political party because they have the willingness for change. And I think that's what we should be aiming to go forward and to change a little bit the practice of what was done before. Because we shouldn't join political parties because we want a job. You should be very good at your job before you join a political party. And then you can make an actual contribution to it. So this is what I wanted to emphasize, which I think is really important for all of our region. And uh, another comment that I had for, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the Italian girl. <laughs> so the, the, comment, uh, the comment that I had there is that digitalization should not be seen as something that is separate and you know, that it has to be by itself. It always has to be complementary. For instance, I remember when I was in university, this was very long ago and pre-COVID, what we did is that our lectures were recorded so you could access them after the class, so you could see them in case you, you were to miss them or in case you wanted to re-listen to them again, but you had your professor there. So I think this is what we should be aiming for, especially for a transitional period. It shouldn't be just digital, 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 everything. It should be both options until, well, our generation is already accustomed to it. But again, as the professor mentioned very, very wisely, 
you cannot really replace the feeling of having your professor in front of you teaching and you know having all that activity and being being there with you you can't really replace that so i think this is also applicable to a few other areas as well you know no, no matter as hard as you try you can't replace a doctor like i mean of course you can do the processes a little bit and you can do the consulting but you can't replace that so we shouldn't really go digital 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 because that would remove the, 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 the personal element and the uh, empathetic element to it. So I think this also goes back to the, to, the, to the first question about education, which I think is that helix that's really important. So for instance, what we've done in Albania, we've raised a group of, um, we've brought together all the deans of the universities that are in front of the government. So on one side we have the deans of universities and on the other side we have all the heads of the government that represent each specific institution. And what we're trying to do is to discuss which are the jobs of the future and which jobs we actually are obsolete now and we do not need graduates for those kind of jobs. So this is what we're trying to do to address the issue that you mentioned. But of course there are many other solutions. This is just one that we decided to test out. So uh, thank you all very much for your input. Um, I think we have um, some time for three more questions maybe. So Andre has already a list, I think. So please go on. Hi, you hear me? Yeah, I'm from Bulgaria. Um, I have a question which is related uh, about the political parties and it's more on um, political organizational level. And um, so in our political party, since 2017, we have an app that we created which actually allows us to um, communicate with each other in the political party the whole time. And we can see the news that's happening. We communicate with anyone from the party, including the leaders. Um, and also during meetings of the national and the executive boards there, we can vote through the app for what's, what's happening as members. Um, and also there is a part for fundraising. And this is very novel for Bulgaria, no, no other party has it. B and we've, we've had that since 2017 and we've been using it actively. And that's why COVID didn't really hit us hard as a political organization and our communication strategy. And I wanna ask you in your countries, do you have such kind of uh, platforms that you use in political parties and organizations for uh, internal communication and voting as, as it comes for the structure of the party and for important decisions to be made from the executive board and national board of the parties. And do you think that's a necessity for political parties to actually move forward and achieve modernization and digitalization and to actually combat the restrictions that COVID-19 imposes to them? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question? So oh, you can go, please. Uh, I would actually like to give an answer this time, kind of uh, maybe followed up by a question or even uh, a comment from your side. Um, I think that uh, what we want as a Generation Z, what we really, really want, is uh, is not that hard to 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 know if we analyze the situation um, as for opportunities i think governments organizations and different institutes are really into it and are trying their best to give young people and uh, as much as many opportunities as possible and as for albania for example i'm pretty satisfied with the opportunities my my country gives me um, in in Theoretically, there, there are plenty of opportunities, but not only in Albania, Balkans as well. Uh, as for um, potential between the, the young people, uh, we mentioned before that they leave to Western uh, states and they're toppers in the, the course they're following, so they have great potential. We have opportunities, we have potential, so what is lacking then? What's the problem? <coughs> I guess what they want, an answer to a way to find an answer to that is uh, see what they're finding at the places they're going. So 
What else does, um, let's say, a Western country offer more than opportunities? Uh, I don't think that the only reason or the most common reason is better job opportunities, because I know uh, people who have a bachelor's degree in, in uh, let's say, Albania, since I'm from Albania, and they work as a b um, pizza delivery guy. Doesn't matter, with all due respect to every type of honest job. It's not only the better job opportunities, I think it's trust. They know that they will work, but they will gain as well. They will be uh, appreciated, and they will take what they deserve, you know? So instead, here in Balkans, I feel like they don't trust that if they do give effort to a job, or if they do give efforts in school, they will be appreciated, because there's too much corruption and lack of meritocracy. You know, I think that is one of the main problems that is making young people leave the Balkans and uh, try to focus on Western countries or other countries. So it's not only the opportunities or lack of talent and potential, it's actually that every time we try to join an organization, we feel like we'll, they will use us, or job places, they will use us, instead of uh, actually being appreciated for what we offer and the full potential we have, we're just a number in there, and we're not, um, our rights are not actually fulfilled. So m that is an answer to the question of what Gen Z wants. I think they want, well, appreciation, meritocracy, money. Uh, they want to, to g take what they give. You know, they don't just want to give. And then my question uh, followed <laughs> that follows this is, how much are governments and organizations focusing on making sure that they are appreciating and valuing the young potential that is in Balkans as it is a really big wound and almost tragic for, for such huge potential to leave and uh, be given to other countries when it's actually ours. Thank you. Um. Yes, I think there's a, another question up there, and then I have another one from Egli, and then we're done. So, <laughs> please. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Donna, and I'm a young European ambassador from the Republic of North Macedonia. And I will stand up <laughs> if you can see me. Um, my question is uh, for the Minister for Youth and Children. Um, okay, so um, this entire debate has been devoted to how to improve the education and how to link the education with what is required right now in, in the labor market. And it was mentioned for more traineeships and workshops to be available to students so once they have their bachelor degrees they will be more skilled. But um, a few months ago I read an interested analysis that represented the world. Uh, it actually showed how the world would have looked like if it was composed only of 100 people. Uh, so, for an example, if the world had only 100 people, 49 would, 49 would have been women, 51 would have been men, and so on. You, you see where I'm going. And per the analysis, if the world was composed of 100 people, only one would have had a uh, degree of high education. So basically, um, I believe that we are forgetting one important aspect, and that is that a really small percentage of young people actually do have a bachelor degree. And uh, not that if they're skilled enough is a completely different topic, but I believe that nowadays uh, a few really uh, small percentage of young people have bachelor degree. And I believe that they are neglected, especially in North Macedonia. There is literally none, not even a single measure that has been taken for these young people to get some kind of job opportunities. And I will uh, take the liberty to say that this is the group which is leaving the country most, and like they're literally ready to do anything to get a Bulgarian passport just so that they go can go in Germany and work in McDonald's. So my question was, uh, have you in Albania uh, taken some kind of action that maybe other Balkan countries can follow that is uh, completely regarding this young people because at the end of the day uh, we can't all work in the IT sector and uh, I mean it, and we are all aware that uh, in order to have um, healthy society and healthy economy though the second class uh, is what is required strong second class so thank you so uh, early you can go with uh, another question and then we have a last one uh, in uh, Zoom from a participant. 
Alexander, I think. So, Egli, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I am Egli and I'm from Greece. Um, I would want to go a little bit back on the conversation and uh, focus on the start of our session and address the question to Mr. Kristolica. I'm sorry, I pronounced your name, no, or your name wrong, I think. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so, what I wanted to ask uh, is regarding about the COVID-19 era and the democratization uh, factor. And just to give a little bit of a Greek context in the conversation and the question that I will later ask. So right now we're um, dealing with a huge anti-vaccination movement back in Greece. And um, this is very bothering to me because I can see that, of course, uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID era is an, an absolute disaster for each and every one of us, and we want to move forward and to pass this obstacle that um, the health systems are now facing. But uh, it leaves many questions behind regarding the democratization process and uh, the outcomes of um, uh, or maybe the cultural impact and the social impact that this uh, uh, crisis, this health crisis has left. Uh, so actually we see that those uh, anti-vaccine movements are strongly based on social media groups and media platforms that promote consp uh, conspiracy uh, theories and fake news. And also we have um, uh, witnessed that social media platforms could foster social change by uncovering uh, political scandals and giving the floor to the youth in order to use those tools uh, in a digitalist era in order to put them in front and um, uh, let them, uh, give them space. So what is my question here is, uh, do you feel it's useful that um, the civil society sector now can uh, bring to the conversation of democratization the elements and the experience that we have gained from the COVID-19 era? Or do you find that it's a little bit early in order to uh, handle with such sensitive topics? And if you do find that useful, could you give us some guidelines that uh, we could follow in order to handle those hot topics? Because I, I see and I understand that they're uh, sensitive and maybe too political, but I think that there is space for uh, youth organizations um, except political parties in order to engage with those, uh, uh, with those topics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Egli. I will read the last one from, uh, from Zoom platform, uh, from a participant called uh, Alexander. Um, uh, what do you think about uh, deeply rooted corruption and what do you want to say about the NATO bombing of Serbia? Well, that's not that relevant, but okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, because there are, because of this, there are not decent jobs, and because of the war that happened here in the region. Um, yes, I think that uh, we can go on with answering the questions, whoever would like, and uh, also, you know, uh, give some concluding remarks uh, before we finish this plenary session. Thank you. I think three of the questions were, were sort of relevant to, to my area. So I'll start with the first one in regards to the political parties. Uh, I'd like to answer for the political party I ran with. Uh, so the Socialist Party in Albania, we actually did, uh, did do the digitalization. It was something that set us apart from the opposition in the previous elections. And we did, uh, pra uh, we did practically put online all of our system both members and every single other data that we had, and this, of course, was a big advantage. So I think when it comes to political parties, of course, you have to go at the same speed and at the same pace of the digital revolution, because otherwise you will not be able to keep in touch with your voters and with everybody else as well. Especially if you're, if you're targeting the youth, then, you know, if you're targeting the youth and you're not using WhatsApp, then what are you really doing? So I think that kind of covers the whole gist of it. And if I go back to the other question, which was from Stacy, uh, I think you do make a valid point. Th that's exactly what I was talking about. The fact that there is a little bit of a mismatch in the market when it comes to the very well prepared people and the jobs, but they're not getting there together. 
Uh, I do think that the meritocracy and the corruption in our region overall are not actually as bad as our media makes it sound. So I think it's a little bit, <laughs> like I'm sorry, this sounds funny, but like I, I used to live in the UK for a very long time. And in six years, I never saw those terrible and disturbing news on the media. Like I never saw, you know, this corruption here, corruption there, corruption there. And if you look at the statistics, it's actually, you know, it doesn't really fit with, uh, with the image that our media does. This, of course, is not to say that we don't have corruption. This is not to say that we do not have issues mer where meritocracy does not happen. But I think what's happening with the whole media in our region is that it's, it's painting an even more grim picture than what it actually is. And this is, hap this, is ha this is acting as a deterrent for the youth. You know, not, not later than yesterday, I had an experience that I was looking for an, a consultant to assist me as part of the work at the ministry. And like, I actually did not have enough applications. And when I sent it to this WhatsApp group that they're like a pool of experts and I, and I sh shared this to them and I told them, can you please apply because I need a good expert to help me out with this. And you know, it's like sponsored by one of the big organizations so it's gonna pay well. The answer that I got was like, yeah, this is already set and you're giving it to somebody. When I know specifically that for this case, that's not, that's not happening. So what I mean is that sometimes people are getting deterred from applying to positions because they think that there is no meritocracy. So I think this is also uh, helping a little bit the system. So perhaps this is something that we have to keep in mind. Like sometimes it's not enough to say that this job is not meritocrati meritocratic if you haven't tried it. So perhaps with the youth, they shouldn't give up so easily is what I would suggest. But on the other hand, of course, we have to try and prepare better alignment with the job market and the education. So those job fairs should be something that occur a lot more often so that we make sure that at least uh, the people that are graduating from school, they know which kind of jobs are available to them. So I think this also will help in this direction. I hope I answered your question. And if I go back to the question from the back, which actually, like here I need Stacy to help me because I don't think we have the same problem in Albania. The problem that we have in Albania is that the majority of our youth is actually with a bachelor degree and in the majority of cases they even have a master's degree. So we have a very small percentage of youth that is actually not getting a bachelor degree so we're facing a little bit <laughs> a different problem. And actually like what's happening in Albania is that the majority of people that are leaving the country are from this bracket. So it's the very highly educated youth that are deciding to leave the country. So we're not having the same issue with, uh, with the people not deciding to follow higher education. But uh, in certain cases when we did have this issue, what we try to do is invest more on vocational schools. And actually our vocational schools are a lot better now. In the past we barely had any of those, but in the past four years we have invested very heavily to try and make sure that they have the same sort of reputation as the high school, as the normal universities have. Because this is what we have a mentality issue, at least in Albania. I cannot really speak for the rest of the region if it's the same. Thanks. Okay, I can go next. Thanks for this setup of discussions and questions since, since I, 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 I believe our lives revolve around these topics. Um, specifically, I will beg to differ um, with my colleague on, 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 on these points. I think that corruption and quality uh, being a part of the quality of life, as I mentioned previously, I believe corruption and uh, political circles of influence and trust are a nuclear prob problem for the region and for, and for our country uh, in particular. A nuclear problem. Um, I believe that uh, I, I would like to believe that we can get better and that we can be better and that we can have the participation and the right people uh, uh, at the right positions at the right time, etc., etc. But we haven't really proven that we can do it in the past 30 years. And 30 years is, I believe, long enough. Uh, in 30 years, uh, a country can be put upside down by 
proper government, proper policies and strategic focus into what that country wants to do. And we can have, we, we, we can mention a really good example in Singapore, for example, uh, a very small country city that was uh, almost nothing in the financial world in the 60s. And it's on top of that world today. So it's, it's, it's really doable, but we are not getting it done. And uh, why we are not getting it done is because we have a vicious cycle of um, uh, that, that no one is really prepared to break because it works for the majority of the people and for the majority of the, of the processes and specifically political participation as it is set up right now. And this is why people that uh, know better, that have seen better, leave. I don't think there's, uh, uh, we are not connecting the jobs and, and the people and the skills well. I think uh, we are connecting them even better than uh, there are people available. So um, it's, it's a very um, hard problem which can be resolved only by a responsible government um, and by correct and focused policies um, where we won't have too many high, highly educated people or not only educated but skilled people adapted to the current market having amazingly well paid jobs with proper authority, teams, communication, benefits and everything leaving like that, like the slides, leaving just like that because the air is too polluted. And why is the air too polluted? Because someone decided that bringing, uh, uh, bringing uh, trash from foreign countries and burning it here was, a good, was good business. And th this is an actual example of what has been going on in the region. So this is why people leave and this is why we cannot grow in our industries as much as we would like to. If we would like to have, uh, if we would like to grow with a hundred people in the next one month, we could do it immediately, tomorrow, Monday. Because we don't have the people. We I'm sorry, there are uh, more questions to be answered, so the, uh, we can continue later. The people are, are leaving because of corruption and because they are looking for better quality of life that they are not seeing here. Um, uh, oh, okay, great. It's better now. So, um, I will continue uh, for this topic. Uh, actually, the conversation is very interesting. Um, okay, I will start from the thing that you said before, that uh, in the, uh, what they really, really want is uh, to have respect in the place where they work, uh, to have uh, somebody that uh, can guide, to have uh, a place where uh, they have a good quality. And I think that all these things connected, and that's what uh, I found about Generation Z and uh, all these things I also showed in the presentation, that people need this. Um, the thing is that uh, there is a mismatch of uh, what they need, what is the reality, what is happening with the country or the corruption or all this stuff. Um, so what can we do now? Um, I think that it is uh, a thing for each of us in this room uh, to promote this respect, to promote this attitude, to promote this in the environment, uh, in the place that we are moving every day, in the, in the way we live our life, and the way we, co we cooperate in a conference group, for example, volunteering community, uh, and the way that we uh, co cooperate with our colleagues in the university, uh, in a small business or in a big business. Uh, we should uh, give the example to everyone else. Uh, we should uh, train ourselves and our colleagues 
in that way, in that quality way, in our everyday life. Uh, because if we want to ask for this kind of quality, we, we should also offer it. So we, as a generation, should uh, work on it and level up ourselves and ask the pressure we were uh, talking about before to all the politicians, uh, all the decision makers, or all the governments uh, to adopt this. Um, if we all want and if we all uh, ask for this pressure, we can do it. I mean, it's not that we want something really weird uh, they will refuse. Uh, if we <laughs> really ask for it and um, uh, be present and act for that one, we can do it. And also corruption is um, a thing that, uh, I mean, I don't want to blame us as citizens who vote the politicians, but I blame us as citizens who vote the politicians because we vote them. <laughs> so if citizens do not agree with the corruption, of a politician that is corrupted, then citizens, please, don't vote him or her. So um, they vote, uh, we vote for personal interests, uh, for uh, like lobbying, or uh, uh, we are a part of the problem. So uh, it's a, a thing of mindset in the cooperation in a future job, um, in uh, the corruption thing, in all the things that are happening around us. And now, uh, as mentioned before, not all countries have um, like too many uh, bachelor uh, students. Uh, we, we also have the same situation in Greece. Uh, we have too many and they all want a quality job, but there are not that many jobs. Okay. Um, but we are in a bubble of people who are interested in these topics, are discussing about these topics, participate in projects like that, are active, are wondering, uh, co co uh, cooperate, discuss, but not everyone in the generation has the same perspective. They may have to propose better solutions than we do, or they may not even care. We don't, I mean, we are in a bubble right now of people that we are on the same side of the pa of the, how can I say the paper? Um, yes, so, um, we should work on this uh, generation, in general, for all these things. While you were talking, something did come to mind, and perhaps this will sound a little bit as pessimistic, but I do want to leave you with one final message. You know, in for all of our region, of course it's not easy to live in the countries that we live in. In some easier than others, in some more difficult. But one thing that I feel is that for our generation, the easy choice, like the easy option, is always to leave and to go to, the, to one of the EU countries. And there it's easy because somebody else has made that country ready for us. However, I feel that our impact is always the greatest and the biggest in the countries where we're from. And we're always most needed there because one of the issues why our whole region is perhaps not improving, even though there have been 30 years, is the fact that all the brain seems to leave. So perhaps if I may ask you something, is to not leave your country before actually trying really, really, really hard to make an impact there. I mean, it's okay to leave if you want to deepen your knowledge, it's okay to leave to follow an education, but what I would like to ask from you is make an effort to even come back and try and bring some of that knowledge and that know-how in your own country. Thank you, thank you very much for, for this answer. And uh, I will go on with um, uh, Mr. Kartolice and uh, a final answer to Egli's question and maybe some concluding remark as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will start the answer of the last question connected to the anti-vaccine movement by uh, giving perspective of the rise of the new radical right in Europe. And namely, I have been studying the rise of the new radical right since 2010. And I must say that the rise of the new radical right in European countries has really marked the political scene in the European Union and also in the uh, rest of the European continent. Uh, that is the reason why many authors, uh, when they write about the new radical right parties, they very often 
say that the rise of the uh, new radical right parties, uh, or they try to por portray uh, that rise as a huge danger to the European democracies. Why? Because the new, new radical right parties offer policies, for example, against globalization, against European Union, against immigration, against corrupted elites, or to sum up, they try to divide societies, them against us, corrupted elites against pure people, and they belong to the pure people, domestic population against migrants, national sovereignty against European sovereignty, and so and so on. And before the COVID-19 outbreak, such rhetorics gave huge impetus for the new radical right in the European countries. They managed to win many votes in the European countries. What is very interesting thing? It is interesting thing that the COVID-19 outbreak somehow managed to stop their rise and even on short run, decrease their ratings. Why? Because picking them versus us in a times of pandemics, it's not appropriate. Giving easy solutions, it's not appropriate in times of pandemics. Additionally, speaking against globalization, I was speaking about the European Union, really has lost momentum during the COVID-19 crisis. So practically during the COVID-19 crisis, I would like to say that people decided to ra rally around the flag, not to divide. What is the problematic issue now? The problematic issue now is that the anti-vaccination -vac uh, movement is again dividing the people. On one side, people who are supporting the process for vaccination and on the other side, people who are against. It is my opinion that the new radical right is going to use such division and it's going to make such division their main topic in the next elections. I agree it's a sensitive topic, but I do not agree that we should not react immediately. If we do not react immediately, it's going to become sensitive problem. So my message will be government, civil, sec civil society sector, doctors, all these sectors must uh, explain to the citizens why it's important to get vaccinated and why it's dangerous to support anti-vaccination movement. That is very important uh, project in the next couple of months, in the next couple of years. Also, it's very important somehow to, to push back, to find resources, to find tools, to push back against this informi this informi uh, uh, against this informi uh, against the fake news in the media we must fight this problem now because if we leave the podium i'm afraid that the new radical right is going to use that podium for further growth I hope that I answered the question, that you're satisfied with the answer. Thank you very much. I think Agli is satisfied with uh, the answer. So if you don't want to add anything, I would uh, like to thank you all personally for being here uh, today with us and sharing your thoughts and expertise on such an important topic. And I hope that you all of you enjoyed. Uh, if I may, I would take just one minute of, uh, of the time just to uh, answer to Alexander uh, for his question, because um, Alexander, you said that I censored you. 
but uh, the truth is that you firstly censored yourself by not turning on your camera and posing the question yourself, if you wanted so much to receive this kind of question. But um, the truth is that um, I come from a country that is uh, the second, uh, in, that has the second highest unemployment rate in the entire EU, and we were not bombed by any NATO so far. So I think that uh, it's uh, wherever you are in the world, whatever is your standpoint, it's a matter of uh, political will, of course, but it's also a matter of your own perspective, your state of mind, uh, your um, intention to work and actually bring the change that you want to see. So thank you all for being here. And um, I hope that you will relax right now and we'll have a nice uh, tour around the city. See you all tomorrow. <laughs>